The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting. For creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast. For the stories. Companies in banking and retail will buy data broker data to figure out information about their current customer base as well as to conduct research on expansions of that customer base. Credit companies will buy data broker data to inform you know, credit scores and transactions and things of that nature. Insurance companies are another big client for data brokers. There's been great reporting demonstrating the ways in which health insurance companies will buy tons of data broker data on individuals income level sexual orientation health history all this kind of stuff to try and algorithmically predict how much they can charge them for healthcare so it's really big in the insurance space and then there's lots of other smaller and medium sized companies relatively speaking that might just buy data broker data to run advertisements towards particular customer segments so there really is a wide use of data broker data in the private sector and tons and tons of companies buy it. I mean, this is part of why it's a multi-billion dollar industry. I'm Jacob Schultz, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, September 1st, 2021. A privacy and national security threat that goes under discussed are data brokers, a secretive industry of companies buying, aggregating, selling, licensing, and otherwise sharing consumer data. I sat down this week with Justin Sherman to talk about data brokers and the national security threat that they pose. Sherman is a fellow at Duke University's Technology Policy Lab, where he directs his project on data brokers. He also recently wrote a piece for Lawfare about data brokers advertising data on U.S. military personnel. It's the Lawfare Podcast, September 1st, Data Brokers and National Security. All right, Justin. So we'll get to your report and and your lawfare piece in a bit, but I want to start with the most basic stuff here. So what is a data broker? A data broker is a company whose entire business model is secretly buying and sharing and selling data. So this is data on Americans. This is data on people around the world. And you may never have heard of these companies, but The fact is that it's not just Facebook or TikTok collecting our information. Every time we interact with a website or a business, in a lot of cases, they're actually then selling that data further to these other entities. And that's what a data broker is. So they're not the the sites doing the collection themselves, right? It's, It's these places that aggregate and then sell data that's been collected elsewhere. Is that right? Some data brokers have access to what they will call first party data. So data they do in fact collect directly and Oracle is a great example of a company that has spent millions of dollars buying up other companies that do directly get access to the data. But you're correct that in a lot of cases with data brokers, they are buying it from other companies, they are licensing it from other companies, there's different kinds of arrangements, but it's oftentimes not stuff they collect directly. And that's part of their marketing pitch is that we're not just getting data from one single platform, but we're aggregating data across many different sources and packaging it together. And so before we go further, I want to try and concretize this a little bit for people. So what are the component parts of the data broker industry? So what are what are the types of things that people, when they're interacting with the internet, that they would just attribute to some sort of weird weird thing that they're seeing on the internet are actually component parts of the data broker industry. Just give us some examples. Anytime that you are 
looking up a product on one website and then on several other websites, you're getting advertisements for those, those products. There's typically a data broker involved in some part of that process because one of the ways that ad networks or websites or other things find out what you're doing on other websites is that they will have to acquire that data from another party. And that's part of this data brokerage ecosystem. Uh, Another example is if anyone has ever Googled themselves or Googled someone they know, and these white pages websites come up saying, something like click here to find out information about this person or or run a background check. Those are also a kind of data broker where they will go and scrape government records, tax filings, property records, voting records, and aggregate that all together in a searchable format online. And so that's another example of a day-to-day interaction some people might have with a data broker. So the industry is enormous. It's billions and billions of dollars. It's a global industry. There are dozens and dozens of American companies, large American companies in this industry. But again, because it's 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 shadowy and it's secretive, many people have never even heard of it. And, and so why is it so shadowy? Is it is it shadowy as a public relations choice to keep these things sort of, you know, to keep this activity hidden? Or is it Data privacy research these days is a pretty target-rich environment in which there's lots of different things to look into and lots of different problems, and people just don't tend to focus on data brokers. What do you? What's your diagnosis of why data brokers have managed to stay in the relative, you know, shadows for so long? It's a combination of those and other factors, I think, to a large extent, and and we can talk more about this in terms of what I found when I was doing my research, but. It is a PR move to be very opaque about not just what a company is doing, what data it's buying on people, what data it's selling on people, but even basic information about the company. The fact that it exists, its size, its revenue, uh, those are all things that I think are deliberately hidden or at least not advertised in a very high profile way on purpose. There's also, as you had said, the fact that Every day now, it seems, there is new reporting on some sort of data privacy scandal or a data breach. And so from the public's perspective, it's hard to keep track of all of these things. And as part of that, the data brokerage industry has not gotten a lot of focus. It's, of course, a good thing that I think many Americans are more aware of the ways that big platforms, for example, collect data on us. But Now it's time, I think, to go to the next step and say, once those platforms have the data, what happens next? And in this case, it's it's buying and selling. So there's lots of reasons. And then, you know, the third thing I'll add is from a policy perspective, data brokers have not gotten enough attention either, whether that's because the FTC does not have enough authorities to fully pursue the industry or because the national security establishment has focused a lot on potential direct collection of data, like with the whole TikTok debate, and not talked about the broader data sharing and selling ecosystem. Yeah, I want to get back to some of those policy questions later. But first, make the case to me of why data brokers are a national security problem, right? So there's, there's obvious overlap between lots of data privacy and national security issues. But I'm curious to hear you talk about what about data brokers in particular raises national security concerns? The thing to understand with data brokers is that the depth and range and volume of data that they hold and that they openly advertise for sale on Americans is enormous. It's it's really hard to wrap your head around. Axiom, for example, which is a U.S. company, it's one of the largest data brokers on the planet advertises data on literally billions of people around the world. And on those billions of people, it says it has thousands, if not tens of thousands of individual data points. So if we just think about that for a second, that really is an extraordinary amount of information on any one individual to have thousands of data points, let alone to have that at such a scale. And so 
the reason this is such a concerning thing from a national security perspective is twofold. There's in particular an issue with data brokers actively advertising data on military personnel and government employees. And this was something I found in the report I recently published at Duke, is that uh, multiple data brokers advertise data on current and former members of the U.S. military, including whether they're active duty, where they're stationed, what things they like to buy, you know, where they spend their money. And there are also data brokers who advertise data on members of the federal government. And so this is not to say necessarily that every use of that data is nefarious. Obviously, veterans, for example, are a very unique demographic, and we can imagine lots of ways and reasons why a company might want to you know, target advertisements for certain goods and services to that group. But all to say, these companies have all of this data on people who are currently in the military, and they're putting it out there for people to buy. <laughs> So that, I think, really is concerning because when we talk about adversarial governments building large data sets on members of our government and security establishment, this is one way to do that. When we talk about you know, whether particular threat groups could track down members of the military to where they are actually physically located, this is another way that could be done. So that's sort of the first thing is that these data brokers quite disturbingly, or outright advertising data on members of the military and the government. And the second thing is a broader comment on data brokers, which is that they have such a large volume of data on Americans that you can imagine an organization using that for any number of, of purposes. So for example, if you wanted to build a profile on a diplomat ahead of a key negotiating summit, there are data brokers who advertise, put in someone's name and will tell you all their family members and their relatives and will crawl their, you know, their social media and pull all of their key network connections. If you put in their credit card number, we can tell you things they've bought, where they like to shop. You know, we can give you internet search patterns. So I can go on, but all to say, if we think about this in a national security context, there are many kinds of intelligence operation, blackmail, coercion, profile building activities that you could do with this data in addition to, you know, targeting disinformation and things like that that are just are really concerning. And so we'll, we'll get to the your report in one second, but just to sort of push a little bit further on what you're saying here. So if you were to make a tally of the lawfare articles that, that talk about TikTok versus articles that talk about data brokers, right? The the count would be very much in favor of these sort of first order collection problems and, and data breaches in that sense. And obviously lawfare, not representative of the entire national security ecosystem, but nonetheless. <laughs> so what do national security thinkers lose when focusing just on those sort of primary collection issues at the expense of, of overlooking the things that happen to data after it gets collected, things like data brokers? That's a great question. So, I mean, l let's talk about TikTok as an example. So Look, I mean, any listeners who have followed what I've written on that know that, you know, there are real privacy and I think there are real privacy and security questions to ask about TikTok. I also think the Trump administration's policy was bad for various reasons. But all to say, if the general end state we're trying to control for in that case is we don't want sensitive data on millions of Americans in the Chinese government hands. Okay. Direct collection through a mobile app is a potential way that that data could get into the government's hands, but it's only one vector. And this is exactly, to your question, what we're losing when we focus on just that first order collection and that company relationship is even if TikTok was blocked uh, in the US, that doesn't stop TikTok from sending data to a bunch of advertisers through its platform. It doesn't stop TikTok from sending users' locations and watch histories through third-party code. And it also doesn't stop TikTok from, say, just selling all of that information to a data broker, which can then 
completely legally sell it to a Chinese entity. So it's important to talk about the, the direct collection and some of the direct company relationships. But the fact is, if we only focus on that, we're going to miss all of these other vectors through which data is currently shared and sold and diffused. And then as a result, we're not going to have a toolkit that actually addresses all of those different vectors at once. That makes a lot of sense. So you released this big report. You want to tell us what's what's in the report? What were the things that, that stood out to you the most? This is a report I wrote for the cyber policy program at Duke, at the public policy school at Duke. And I surveyed 10 major data brokers. And what I found was that these data brokers were openly advertising data on U.S. individuals' sensitive demographic characteristics. So things like race, ethnicity, gender, marital status, income level. I found these brokers advertising data on U.S. individuals' political preferences and beliefs, causes they support, advertising data on uh, individuals' whereabouts, even their real-time smartphone GPS locations. And then, as I mentioned, data brokers advertising data on current and former members of the U.S. government and the U.S. military. And so what I catalog in there is in detail the kinds of data, the services they offer related to that data, whether that's search functions or, like I referenced, an ability to crawl through someone's social media profiles. But it was meant as a survey of the space because I think there is not enough awareness of not just what these data brokers might be doing secretly, but what they openly talk about, you know, selling in their marketing documents, which is data on millions and millions and millions of Americans. It's a sprawling report. There's a lot in it. What were the things that really ended up surprising you the most, right? It's a type of inquiry where, you know, you come across lots of different things, doing a big survey. What were the things that that were most unexpected for you? I was shocked but not surprised, I think I would say, by a lot of different findings. One of them was what we've we've been talking about with the data on military personnel and government employees. There was also data that Axiom, one of the large brokers, advertises on first responders, on healthcare workers, on students. So that was a little shocking as always to see how openly some of the firms were advertising data on these different groups. I was also struck by one of the companies in there talking all about smart device data. So anything from smart speakers to video doorbells to motion detectors to smart thermostats, this company talked at length about as great sources of data the potential sources of data for its clients and its platform. So that was another thing, you know, highlighting how it's not just say Amazon maybe listening through your Alexa, but data brokers are also looking to plug into these data sets. And then the third thing I'll highlight is the GPS locations, which multiple data brokers advertised and I think is really an illustrative example of the problems posed by this industry because location data is valuable to these companies, not just because you can follow someone around, but you can derive a lot of information about their life out of their travel history. You can see, are they visiting a marriage counselor, a mental health therapist, an abortion clinic, a cash loan office, right? You can get a lot of data about their life through that. And also because there are lots of real world cases actually where location data on individuals, on Americans, has been used to actually inflict physical violence and harm. Yeah, the the GPS tracking data in particular is one thing that just combing through your report really, really struck me. Do you you talk a little bit about, so what's the process by which these data brokers would acquire that information, right? So is the preliminary tracking is done through presumably different things attached to your cell phone, and then they 
relay those onto the data brokers. Talk a little bit about the sort of the way that that data gets transacted before it gets to the broker. It's a very opaque process. And as with anything in the data broker space, this is a challenge in analysis. But there are brokers who will get data from apps that will get access to your GPS location, and then will also sell that to a data broker. But many of the cases where these companies are getting your GPS data, it comes from third-party code and software development kits that plug into an app. So to give an example, and I'm, I, I didn't find anything specifically on, on Uber, but I'll use Uber as an example. If you open the app, right, you can give your location while you're using it to Uber so that they know where to send a ride that you're ordering. But as part of that process, there might be a bunch of other companies' code that Uber essentially attaches on to its app to do different functions. And sometimes those third-party code developers will also get data and a lot of the time that's gps data so uh, another way data brokers will get this gps information is not just going to apps directly but going to the ecosystem of code providers and advertisers that surround the app and buying it from them as well did you know this podcast is powered by acast acast is the home of podcasting for creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast. For the stories. And so in the course of, of doing all this research, did you get a sense of how the industry has grown over time, right? So one way of thinking about it might be that, you know, there's there's so many more vectors of, of first order collection now than there had been however many years ago. And so the industry would have growth consistent with that factor. Is that right? Has the industry really, really burgeoned over time? It has grown over time. And there has also, which I think is a really interesting trend, been a lot of consolidation within the data broker market in the last five or so years. So because of the lack of privacy regula uh, regulation in the US at the state and federal level, and because mobile apps are built in many cases from the beginning with advertisers and third-party code, there are a lot of ways our software ecosystem has been built for this kind of data sharing, selling, and surveillance from the outset. So that in part, is one of the reasons why data brokerage has long been a practice of companies wanting to you know, sell data to advertisers or share data with one another for specific business purposes. But we have seen a real growth in data brokerage in the last you know, 10 years, at least. And there's probably lots of reasons for that. One, I think, is a growing emphasis on micro-targeting and rather than placing ads to an entire town and make it be the same ad or to an entire group of people and make it be the same ad. There's growing emphasis on, on a really fine grained level of targeting so that, you know, for example, we're not just doing an ad for people who live in New York city. If I'm a company, but I'm targeting, you know, young people in New York city who like to shop at coffee shops on the weekends. And so you can get more and more detailed. So it's definitely grown. And then the consolidation is another key trend. And Oracle, I think, is a really great case study for this consolidation. About five or six years ago, Oracle, which many people rightfully thought of for a while as a cloud and software type company, made a huge pivot towards data brokerage as its core business model. And what happened as a result of that was Oracle started buying up for millions and millions of dollars dozens of different smaller data brokers. And so the numbers on this are unclear, but there's been some reporting to indicate it's maybe six or seven dozen different data brokers that Oracle has bought at this point. So we do also see that kind of trend in the market where 
because there's so much data out there, some of the larger players are seeking to just buy up the companies entirely that are the ones that collect it directly. And to ask you to do a little bit of forecasting here, right? Is there short of regulation on the data broker industry itself, which we'll we'll get to in a second, are there things that you could foresee slowing the growth of the industry, right? Like the way that you describe it, it sounds like the type of industry that is really dependent on a lot of things happening before it, right? So it's, it's dependent on aggressive first order collection. It's dependent on interest from companies in, in using this sort of aggressive digital ad micro-targeting business model, which you know has increasingly come under fire for both its data privacy implications and also just its efficacy. So what do you see as what do you see as the real limits to to how this industry could grow? Is it just regulation of data brokers themselves or are there other things that could sort of slow the growth of of the data broker industry? I'm sure there are lots of market factors that could shift the data brokerage industry's dynamics to some extent. Uh, Google, for example, in the last six or eight months has made a bunch of announcements about changes to how it delivers ads through Chrome, uh, where essentially they're making moves that they're touting as pro-privacy, but also moves that consolidate Google's stronghold on the online ad space. So There's stuff like that because a lot of data broker data is used for advertising that could shape the market a little bit there. But I really do think regulation is the only thing that's going to change the market or really slow it down and shrink it. And in part, and we haven't really talked too much about this yet, because a huge client base for data brokers is not just the private sector, but it's also the government, including the U.S. government the federal government, because there are many law enforcement agencies, the FBI, ICE, that buy up data broker data without warrants, without oversight, without any public disclosure to run law enforcement operations, intelligence operations, to conduct surveillance. So for that reason as well, I don't think we're going to see any kind of market pressure to cut off that data source for law enforcement agencies that want the data without a warrant, we're going to have to see regulation that says, no, 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 you actually need checks in place if you want to acquire this data on U.S. persons. Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about the the client side of things. So, give us a paint us a picture of who are the, the the organizations that do the buying of data brokerage data. Is it as you say? Is it a, a mix of private and public? It is a mix of private and public. Lots of Companies in banking and retail will buy data broker data to figure out information about their current customer base, as well as to conduct research on expansions of that customer base. Credit companies will buy data broker data to inform you know, credit scores and transactions and things of that nature, right? Like Equifax is a data broker. Insurance companies are another big client for data brokers. There's been great reporting out of ProPublica, for example, demonstrating the ways in which health insurance companies will buy tons of data broker data on individuals, you know, income level, sexual orientation, health history, all this kind of stuff to try and algorithmically predict how much they can charge them for healthcare. So it's really big in the insurance space. And then there's lots of other smaller and medium-sized companies, relatively speaking, that might just buy data broker data to run advertisements towards particular customer segments. So there really is a wide use of data broker data in the private sector and tons and tons of companies buy it. I mean, this is part of why it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And then the public sector side, as I mentioned, the primary customers in the US government are law enforcement agencies that will buy real-time geolocation data, that will buy access to LexisNexis, which is a large data broker, because LexisNexis advertises the ability to locate anyone in the country, essentially, with records and location data and other things, and you can search for them. And they, they advertise that their data is updated every 15 minutes. So you can imagine why a law enforcement agency might find that an attractive data source that doesn't need a warrant. You know, one last example is 
public clients buying data you might never think of, like data on your home utility use. There was reporting by the Washington Post and Georgetown University Law Center a few months ago uncovering that ICE was buying a bunch of data from a data broker on utility data from people's homes to essentially determine where people may or may not be living or if they are actually staying in a particular residence. So the client base is large and the data uses are are many. And you allude to this in the piece that you wrote for Lawfare about data brokers and U.S. military personnel, but is there any sort of real significant client base of foreign governments using data brokers as well? Yeah, there's been some reporting done on foreign governments, law enforcement agencies, and and use of commercially acquired data. But this is exactly part of the problem. And this will come up even when I'm, I'm talking about this with federal policymakers, is that because there's so little visibility into this market, because the companies are so deliberately opaque, because there are no checks on what these brokers do and because the government doesn't have requisite authorities to inspect and then publish publicly uh, what these brokers are doing, it's an open question to what extent they sell to foreign clients and to what extent they actually vet, if at all, those clients before they sell to them. So I think the fact that we actually don't know the answer to your question speaks to part of the problem in the first place. Yeah, for sure. So Let's move to the regulatory side of things. So you had written back in April a post for Lawfare in which you, among other things, give a bit of a survey of what the U.S. regulatory landscape is for data brokers. So let's start at the state level. So there are a few states that have laws concerning data brokers or at least give definitions of data brokers. Could you walk us through what some of those examples are? Yes. And I think this is an important case study, right? Because if we're going to put, as I think we should, this industry in a federal privacy law out of Congress, we need to know how we're going to define it. Vermont and California are the two states in the country that actually have a definition of a data broker in their state laws. So the definition of a data broker in the two states is slightly different, but uh, it's it's relatively similar in that they define a data broker as an entity selling data on individuals that are not the business's direct customers. Translation, if you are a company that collects data on your users and then you sell it to someone, you are not qualified as a data broker under these laws because it's your direct customer. It's not information on a third party. So it's a very narrow definition of data brokers. I, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's a good thing to have it be that narrow. And then they have other exemptions as well. Like uh, I forget which of the states it is, but one of them exempts e-commerce platforms completely uh, from being data brokers, which is interesting because e-commerce platforms are constantly uh, sources of this kind of data about what people buy and what they shop for. So but so the but the second main thing to know about these laws is that they're relatively very weak because they don't actually put any kind of restrictions in place on these companies they only require that if you qualify under this narrow definition of a data broker you have to submit some basic information to the state which is then published online so for listeners who are curious and actually our research team is working on coding this right now Uh, These states do have lists of a couple hundred data brokers up on uh, state websites. But again, that's all the law requires, and the companies don't have to say what kind of data they have, who they collected on, who they're selling to. It's literally just identifying themselves as a broker, which is why I think between that and the weird definition, it's, it's kind of a weak legal framework. And also in that piece, you talk a bit about what the FTC has has done, or at least researched in, in terms of data brokers. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the FTC has, and this is not a, a statutory definition, but the FTC has done a lot of great report writing on the data brokerage industry. And certainly there are lots of, of 
very sharp people at the FTC who are thinking about and tracking these issues. And so the FTC has uh, a pretty good report. It's a little old at this point. It's from 2014, but I, I still think it's very well done on the data brokerage industry. And their definition of a data broker is much broader than the definition used by the states of Vermont and California, because the FTC defines a data broker as any company that collects personal information on a consumer and then sells it or shares it with others. So I think to get a little in the weeds here for a second, this is a really important way to define it because one, they're not limiting it to companies that collect on people that aren't their customers. They say, if you collect on any consumer, that is part of the definition. And then the second key part of this definition is that there is verbiage about selling or sharing the information. And I think this is really key as well, because part of what underpins this data ecosystem is that not everything is a direct sale transaction. Sometimes companies license data, they have other kinds of sharing agreements, they just outright share it. So the way the FTC has constructed the definition, I think, is a lot more valuable because it encompasses more of the ecosystem than than do Vermont or California law. And, and so bracketing all the numerous and extensive questions about what it would take to actually get a federal privacy law passed, what which we do not have time to cover today, what do you see as... Should you know? Should data brokers make it into whatever draft might eventually, hypothetically, at some point, exist of a federal privacy legislation? What is what's the right way to go about regulating the industry at the federal level? Right? It's it's a tricky thing in that it it intersects with so many different parts of of people's you know interaction with the internet. Yeah, it's <laughs> um, yeah. We would it, we'd be here for for weeks on end if we were trying to say, are we going to get a, a real law passed? Um, I think I'll, I'll hit on I'll hit on three points here. So the first is just outright integrating data brokers into a federal privacy law, and then restricting this kind of activity, because I am of the belief that it is not good. It is harmful to civil rights, to national security, to democracy. That a U.S. company can have real-time location data on 200 million Americans and sell it to anyone they want. Not even considering the fact that not only would people probably have a problem with that, they might not even know that that company has that data. So I think that's the first thing is in a federal privacy law, defining a data broker in the right way, as we've been talking about, but then also putting restrictions on that practice. I think the second thing actually relates to a bill that Senator Ron Wyden's office released, although they did not technically introduce it, but they released a bill called the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act. And this would give the federal government, or specifically the executive branch, new authorities to put export controls on certain data broker data exports. So what this means in practice is slightly expanding the legal authorities for the Commerce Department so they can actually prevent data brokers from selling U.S. citizen data to certain foreign entities that pose a national security risk. So for example, you can imagine, you know, say Russia, right, where the Federal Security Service uses a number of front companies to do surveillance, cyber ops. You could imagine the government saying, well, actually, we probably don't want a company selling you know, data on 40 million military service members to that actor. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is giving the FTC more authority. This is not just the authority to investigate data brokers themselves, but I think authority also to investigate unfair and exploitative uses of data broker data. I mentioned already there's been reporting on ways that health insurance companies buy data on protected categories, on race, on sex, on gender, and use that data broker data to decide how much to charge or to make predictions about about how much to charge for healthcare. There are also cases where Americans have been denied housing because 
a company will screen a background check and they will get data from a data broker that's actually incorrect, that will wrongly say they had a felony conviction or something. So it's not just the data brokers themselves, but it's also the uses of data broker data in exploitative ways that are hurting American consumers every day. And so that I think is the third main thing that Congress needs to do is give the FTC authority to to go after that stuff. And Justin, to close, the report's done, you, you've done your research, but what are the things that you'll be looking out for? You know, inevitably there's news stories that pop up from time to time about data brokers and there's, you know, different regulatory developments that that are important to them. What are the things that you you have your eye on going forward? I think tracking the albeit slow crawl, uh, advancement of federal privacy legislation is really important. Uh, I also think that part of the reason this issue has not gotten attention, the attention that it should, like we've talked about, is that it's just a very opaque industry and government agencies who might want to look into it maybe can't talk too much about what they know if they operate in the classified space or if they're the FTC, they already don't have enough resources. And so there's constraints there. So I think getting as much information about this uh, and investigations on this industry as possible is really important. And I think that's, you know, that's sort of where our project team on data brokers is headed is in the coming months, we'll be putting out more of these studies and, and in tandem, like I said, I just hope that there's more, more and more policy attention and more hill momentum to regulate this space. And that is all the time we have for today. Justin, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Your audio engineer this week was Hamza Shatu, and the podcast is edited and produced, as always, by Jen Patihau. Your music is performed by Sophia Yen. Please consider rating and reviewing the Lawfare Podcast if you use a podcast service that allows you to do so, and otherwise, share us on Twitter, share us on Facebook share us widely. As always, thanks so much for listening. Hi, it's Rachel Fisher from the Hollywood Crime Scene Podcast, and I'm here to talk to you about Shudder. Shudder is the ultimate streaming service for fans of horror, thrillers, and the supernatural. Shudder offers an unbeatable selection from Hollywood favorites like Halloween and cult classics like one of my personal favorites, Chopping Mall, to original series like Creepshow and The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob Briggs. Check out critically acclaimed new genre films that you won't find anywhere else, all uncut and commercial free. If you're a horror fan like me or just looking for new content to stream, Shudder is a must-have subscription. Sign up and subscribe to Shudder.